I'd like to call to order the City of Littleton City Council regular meeting for Tuesday, May 4, 2020. It is 6.30 or 18.30. City Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Valdez. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Malin. Here. Council Member Driscoll. Here. Council Member Elrod. Here. Council Member Fay. Here. Council Member Grove. Here. Council Member Milliman. Here. We have a quorum. Great, thank you. Um, is there some reason we're not hearing that, that very loud? Uh, Tyler, we're not hearing it down here. At, at, uh, cool. All right, thank you. All right. Sam Fox, assistant to the city manager, if you would please tell us how this meeting will proceed. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council, staff, citizens, and guests. I'm Sam Fox, assistant to the city manager, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this evening's hybrid council meeting. We are streaming this meeting on cable channel 8, Facebook, and on our website at littletongov.org. Please be aware, comments left on Facebook Live will not be moderated and will not be included in the meeting minutes. Those wishing to participate in any public comment portion of the meeting are advised to view the meeting at littletongov.org, My Littleton, Littleton 8 TV, as this broadcast has the least amount of delay. The agenda will be handled by Mayor Valdez the same way it would be handled for a regular in-person meeting. As always, citizen participation is encouraged during public comments and public hearings. To participate via phone, please call 669-900-6833. And when prompted, enter the webinar ID 965-56. Meeting and public hearing. If you wish to speak during either of these opportunities, please call in early and stay on the line. Again, the number is 669-900-6833. And use webinar ID 965-5608-8904. When public comment is announced, press star 9 to raise your hand to be recognized as a speaker. Microphones will be muted for all citizens calling in. Speakers will have three minutes to address council. The clerk will notify you when you have 30 seconds remaining and again when your time is up. For agenda items, Mayor Valdez will ask for a motion and a second, followed by discussion and a vote. Council will vote on agenda items using a thumbs up for a yes vote and a thumbs down for a no vote. The clerk will call each vote with all ayes and nays. Again, if you plan on participating during public comment, please call 669 900-6833. When prompted, enter the webinar ID 965-5608-8904. Please stay on the line and press star 9 to raise your hand to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Great. Thank you very much, Senator Fox. All right. Please stand with me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. All right, thank you. All right, Council, you all had a chance to review the agenda. Any changes? Seeing none, it is approved. Move down to our reports. We'll start with Acting City Manager Kathleen Ulser. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. No report this evening. Great. Do you have anything? How about on the uh, weekends on Main? Oh, so I can give you a quick update. Yeah. So new this year, um, the Littleton Business Chamber and the Historic Downtown Littleton Merchants Association are teamed together to deliver uh, a similar program to what we did last summer with the closure of Main Street, so weekends on Main. Uh, they pursued an event permit through the city's process and then have worked with our public work staff to uh, close those roads again and have a celebration on Friday and Saturday. So this weekend will be the first weekend of Weekends on Main. And there's information on the city's website. So if you were to enter into the search box, Weekends on Main, littletongov.org, you'd be able to get contact information if you have any questions about the event or, or anything that you'd like to find out more. The contact information's on there. Great, thank you very much. So, and it starts Friday, traffic will be diverted four o'clock? Yes. Great. All right. Thank you. City Attorney. No report, Mayor. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Let's go with our council members. We'll start with uh, Council Member Driscoll. 
Uh, thank, Kathleen. thank you, Kathleen, for that update. I was going to do that also. And just a reminder, uh, Hoodlum, or uh, the historic downtown Littleton Merchants uh, Group, will be meeting tomorrow at 8 o'clock, and that will be via Zoom. So uh, just check out their website, um, which, of course, I don't have. That's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Councilmember Elrod. No reports, Mayor. Councilmember Fay. In preparation for our council meeting this evening, I would like to give a little bit of background to um, what council is going to be doing considering the uh, property at the southwest corner of Mineral and Santa Fe. There's some history there that might help making understandable what we're doing. Um, our decision tonight... Council Member Fay, it, if yes. you could save that, the city attorney has some a present or a bit he's going to be talking about it too. If he misses anything, maybe you could uh, give us some at that point. Do you have any other history, uh, any other reports? Uh, when when will when will that be in the agenda? Uh, I have some important things to say. I, so I don't wait, but I don't want to give it up. Number nine B. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other report? Do you have any other report? Oh no. Oh, okay. Was, thank you. That was going to be really good. Okay. Thank you, Council Member Grove. No report. No report. Council Member Milliman. Thanks, Mayor. I have a couple of things. Um, uh, one is uh, just a reminder that Aspen Grove, um, the Pear Street Market has started up again for the season. It's the first Saturday of every month. Um, so I encourage everybody to, um, to drop by Aspen Grove and check out the Pear Street Market. It goes between now and October. Um, also, uh, Hudson Gardens is partnering with Central City Opera um, and they will um, this summer uh, have their um, festival at um, Hudson Gardens. Uh, you could buy your tickets to go see Carousel and to see Rigoletta, which runs July 3rd through August 7th. Uh, and the last little bit of information I'd like to share is the uh, Littleton Housing Task Force met last Thursday for different uh, items I'd like to share. One is they discussed, there was a very robust, extremely fruitful discussion um, about our study session, our joint study session that we had with them in March. And uh, it was very substantive, substantive uh, conversation and looking forward to um, more of those conversations in the future. Uh, the task force is looking at what the next steps are for the ULUC and where they can mobilize um, to, pro to provide input. Third item is the task force is looking forward to meeting with uh, Historic Preservation Board and the Planning Commission again here sometime in the near future. The last item is the task force discussed how to communicate with people in our community who are interested in more affordable housing. Um, and that's all I have for tonight. Great. Thank you very much. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. No report, Mayor. Thanks. All right, well, I have a couple things here. I did attend an RTD meeting this morning. And as you know, RTD was facing some financial challenges before COVID-19 uh, shut everything down. Uh, the financial challenges, of course, continue. Uh, they're even more difficult now. Um, ridership, uh, they reported, is at 40% of pre-COVID, uh, while they're still providing 60% of the pre-COVID services. So they're not providing everything, so they're, but they are providing 60%. Uh, let's see, it is also they mentioned that it's difficult for them to plan um, going forward, because uh, they're not sure how quickly people are going to start utilizing RTD again uh, as their main transportation to and from their work location. RTD does plan to conduct a user fee study in the near future, and because it's because of, I believe it's because of federal regulations that uh, they cannot just make adjustments to fees up or down. They have to do a study, and that study is going to take about 18 months. Also, uh, let's see, at Bemis Library, uh, since uh, 2017, that was three years plus before COVID, uh, Bemis Library um, has had a GED program for Littleton residents. The program is 100% online. Uh, there is no financial cost to the students uh, because the Friends of the Library and Museum sponsor uh, yearly scholarships for the students. Um, tomorrow night, I'll be, tomorrow evening, I'll be attending an event uh, for one of the graduates of the online program. And the ceremony uh, will be online, it'll be virtual, but it, uh, it's pretty cool that Littleton provides its services for its residences. 
residents uh, for them to get their high school degree and, and move forward um, with that. So uh, I, I didn't realize they were even doing that over at BMS. So they've been doing it since 2017. I think it's fantastic. So uh, kudos to those folks. With that, we can move down to item number five, citizen's appearance, of which we have no citizen appearance tonight. We'll go to our public comments. Uh, let's see, where are we? All right, Sema. Sema, if you could tell us how we will uh, proceed with our public, how the public can participate. There we go. Thank you, Mayor. If you wish to address City Council, please call 669-900-6833. And when prompted, enter the webinar ID 965-5608-8904. Press star nine to raise your hand to be recognized as a speaker. Citizen microphones will be automatically muted until a citizen is called upon to speak by the last three digits of their phone number. When called on to speak, please state your name and district or address clearly for the record. Public comment is an opportunity to express opinions or ask questions regarding issues that are not part of public hearings on tonight's agenda. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. The city clerk will notify you when you have 30 seconds remaining and again when your time is up. The City Council is not authorized under the Colorado Open Meetings Law to discuss, comment, or take action at this meeting on any issue raised by public comment that is not part of tonight's agenda. The Mayor may refer the matter to the City Manager and or City Attorney for immediate comment after public comment or to staff to obtain additional information and report back to Council as appropriate. We expect comments to be civil. Disrespectful or disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. At this point in time, I'd just like to remind our callers, if you would like to speak, you need to press star nine now to raise your hand and be recognized as a caller. Great, and I will Thank open you. the public comments up, by the way, at 6.42. Sam, do we have our any callers? Our first caller will be caller 509. Caller 509, you have been unmuted. Please begin speaking. All right, caller 509. All right, Sam, maybe they're having a little trouble there. Do we have another caller we can move to and get back to 509? Can you guys hear me? Oh, oh there we go. There we go. There yes. we go. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Drew Johnson. I'm calling from, uh, I live out uh, Broadway and, and Mineral area, so not too far from the, the River Park development that you guys are talking about tonight. So I just wanted to call in, uh, in support of that project. Um, just a quick couple quick items. Um, you know, first of all, it's going to bring uh, additional retail and, and restaurant options and, into that location, which, you know, that location, I've been in Littleton for about eight years, and that location obviously has been vacant the entire time I've been in Littleton. So um, having more options there, I think, is always a, always a good thing for the uh, for the community, um, not to mention the additional jobs that it'll bring, obviously, for the retail area, and, and having that, the balance of that development with the, um, the retail and the, um, I guess, the apartments, and I, I believe there's also some senior housing that's proposed there as well which I think the, uh, the area could use. Um, and then obviously final, the, the biggest thing, well, one of the big items also was the additional revenue, the city of Littleton as well, with any kind of new development in, in the area. So um, I just wanted to call and support the project. Great. Thank you very much. Sam, our next caller. Okay. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to make just a final reminder to press star nine if you'd like to be recognized to speak for public comment. Our next caller will be caller 493. Caller 493, you have been unmuted and may begin speaking. Good evening, City Council. This is Frank Atwood in District 4, and I'd like to thank your predecessors for the 1990s cash cow of the Industrial Park at South Park, rather than residents. Let's start with their most infamous resident currently, which is, happens to be Triple J Armory. Still, it contributes to Littleton's economic growth. There's Social Security, there's the Dawn, there's MedSouth IPA, there's Science Matters in America, Denver Headaches and Spine Center, Bingo King, Colorado Insulation Company, Behavioral Innovation, uh, Orange Chiropractic and Wellness Center, ADA Carbon Solutions, 
New Track Fulfillment Solutions, Certex Company, Apex Dermatology Group, Tonya Delano, Quest Diagnostic, Quest Modern Communication System, Rocky Mountain Gastroenterology, South Denver Cardiology Association, Sleepworks, The Woodhouse Day Spa, Ona School of Early Learning, Colorado Car Guy, Littleton Day Surgery Center, The Ice Range, Complete Health Chiropractic, Dentist, Colorado Plastic Surgery, Colorado Retirement Association, Ride Design, Pet Relief, McDonald Collision Center, Belco Credit Union, Thurman, Life Care Center of Littleton, uh, Primrose School of Littleton, Littleton Academy, Penske Truck Rental, Republic National Distribution, Conception Reproduction Association, Invasion, Invasion Sally Joke. All of these enterprises contribute to Littleton's economic viability. Again, I thank your predecessors for Littleton's robust economic foresight rather than going with additional residential housing. Your, your predecessors in the 1990s took the hard decision to go with an industrial park. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Sam, uh, next caller. Thank you. Our next caller is caller 500. Caller 500, it's your turn to speak. Please press star six to unmute yourself and begin speaking. <clears throat> caller 500. Hi. Can Hello. you hear me? Yeah, hear you. Thank you. Hi, good evening, uh, Council. My name is Jeff Kelly. I'm an attorney and I live at 6330 South Ponds Way, P O N D S Way, in Columbine Lakes. I'm calling in opposition to the River Park uh, development. I, we have been, as community here, we have, don't feel that we have been adequately consulted by Littleton Public Schools as to the impact of this development uh, on our Jeff, neighborhood. And Jeff, if, if yes. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is an item that will be open to the public comment uh, coming up here. So if you will, uh, if you can, hold off on your comment. You can comment on something else. But since that is on our agenda and it, it will be coming up, uh, that's when it would be appropriate to address that item. I was not aware of that. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, do you have something else uh, before that? No, no I'll wait. Great, we'll wait, we'll know who 500 is. All right, Sam, my next caller. Thank you, Mayor, that was our last caller with the hand raised to be recognized. All right, it is 648, and thank you, callers. Uh, acting city attorney, or acting city manager, do you have anything you'd like to comment on? No, thank you. City attorney? No, Mayor, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, that, with that, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Sam, if you would, please. Thank you, Mayor. Consent agenda items may be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read by title prior to a vote on the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of a council member. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Grove, would you please introduce? Your microphone. A consent agenda items, resolution 22, 2021, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the city of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement of costs associated with the Prince Street Link Project. B, resolution 23, 2021, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the city of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement of costs associated with the Broadway Fiber Optic Communications for Regional Traffic Operations Project. C, Resolution 2421, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement of costs associated with the Mineral Station Mobility Shed Improvements Project. And Paul. D, 
We have a pull. D, motion to approve the April 20th, 2021 hybrid regular meeting minutes. Council, I'm looking for a motion. Mayor, yes. I move to approve uh, consent agenda items A, B, and D. Second. We have a motion and second by Council Member Grove, was it? Okay, all right. All right, thumbs up will be to approve, thumbs down to not approve. Council, ready, vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. At, at some point, we should be able to start using our board. I, I don't see why we're not using it now, actually. So, um, and so we have item number three, resolution 24-2021 was pulled by Council Member Elrod. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so this question goes to Public Works. This is an item that um, we have requested grant funding, but we have not done the public outreach yet as far as design goes for that area. We do know that the changes that are potentially contemplated there have a significant impact to the neighborhood. And I just want to confirm um, and ensure that the outreach will be taking place and that the, the design of um, what's intended in that area, um, when will that happen, what part of the process. I just don't want to put ourselves in a position that we have approved um, something that we have not um, uh, done outreach for yet. Um, my mic doesn't work, so I'm going to have to find one that does. Tyler. Can I, can I just interrupt quick? I'm not sure any of us have internet access. Yep. I think we need the passwords. Thank, thank you. Did this program work? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so re related to the question, yes, we haven't started the work because we haven't started signing the contract yet, which takes place upon approval tonight. Um, so yes, we since the beginning of this project, as part of the agreement in the IGA, we've always planned to do public outreach. That's part of the grant agreement. Um, and the, the shed design out there is based on looking at all the factors, seeking public input before design is completed. That's the intent. This is a design project initially. So yeah, we'll, we'll be including that. But we can't start that until we actually execute the agreement with CDOT, which is what we're executing on today. So to confirm, the what, what, what we're voting on here is, or what we're approving here is funding and an agreement with CDOT for the grant, which would allow us to do the design work, which includes the public outreach as well. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Good. Anything else? Anybody? I'm looking for a motion. I move to approve consent agenda item C. Thank you. And that is resolution 24-2021. Second. We have, uh, we have a second by council member Driscoll. Okay, a thumbs up is to approve, a thumbs down is to deny. Ready, vote. The vote is seven in favor, the motion carries unanimously. Great. Thank you, Council. Moving down to general business, of which we have no general business tonight. So we'll move down to number nine, the ordinances on second reading. We'll start with number A, ordinance 10-2021, an ordinance on second reading amending Title I, Chapter 14, regarding land development impact fees. Uh, we've been talking, Council, we've been talking about impact fees for quite a while, for years, actually. So I think what we have now is... Uh, a presentation on where we are. I'll start with the acting city manager. And so. I'm actually going to turn it over to our finance director, Tiffany Hooten, with a brief presentation. Great. Thank you. No, let's, uh, hang on just one second, if you will, Councilman. Yeah, okay. thanks, Mayor. Do you mind if we pause for just a second? I really do want to get this internet connectivity uh, issue dealt I, I think with that's so I can idea. see the presentation. Yeah. Why don't we take a so five on. minutes? So okay. right now we have uh, 655. Uh, we'll come back at six. Hopefully we'll have internet access.
the meeting for May 4, 2021. I did hear a joke about May 4 today as a Star Wars thing that may, may, may 4 be with you, but, uh, but I'm bump. But uh, anyway, uh, may, may, the, may, the fourth, may the fourth be with you. All right, uh, back to the acting city manager. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so we're actually gonna turn it over to our finance director, Tiffany Hooten, with a presentation. And again, we're covering Ordinance 10-2021. Good evening, Council. Um, before you, we have Ordinance 10-2021, which is related to land development impact fees. Um, I'm Tiffany Hooten, Finance Director, and we also have uh, Brian Duffany on the line as well, um, in case we have any questions for the consultant that prepared the rate study. So the purpose is, does council support an ordinance amending chapter 14 of Title I land development impact fees? Some background is impact fees were originally adopted in 2013. They've been amended several times over the last four or five years. Um, the most recent was in 2019, related to only the museum, library, police, and facility impact fees. Uh, we also did have a study session on March 9th um, with the consultant uh, for a full discussion. And then we had first reading on April 19th. I mentioned Brian Duffany with Economic and Planning Systems. Um, they were contracted with to evaluate our current fee levels and the methods that were currently being used. Um, there's some updates that they presented back in March. Uh, one is adding Public Works fleet replacement costs. Uh, this is a component that wasn't included in the original uh, review, and so we did incorporate that into the current fee schedule. We also did look at new impact fees, and one that we did recommend is a multimodal project impact fee. And then also we had some changes in methodology to kind of reflect current best practices. Uh, the number one uh, change that we made is on non-residential. Uh, it was a flat fee, uh, regardless of the type of development. And we did uh, change that methodology to incorporate a trip fee-based uh, methodology. So all in all, uh, we do recommend to adjust the impact fees uh, as recommended by the consultant. Uh, we do have one exception. Uh, during the discussions on March uh, 9th, there were concerns about uh, the impact on the non-residential non fees. And so we are recommending a phase-in on the new multimodal fee. Um, so it would be 0.3 in the first year, 0.61 in the second year, and 0.91 in the third year. And uh, this is to try to uh, alleviate the concerns about the uh, significant increase if we went to the 100% uh, fee that was recommended. The other thing that we're going to be adding going forward is an inflation factor. Um, so when we come to council each year uh, after the budget process uh, to adopt fees for the next year, we will incorporate an a, uh, inflation factor on the uh, impact fees at that time. And I always just want to caution, you know, the additional revenue that's going to be generated by these impact fees is dependent on the type of development. Um, you know, we're only going to charge it on those who pull permits and want to develop in the city. And so we can't really gauge exactly what the impact would be. We did do a calculation based on known uh, developments in the air in, that are coming forward. And with the 100%, um, it, it's about a difference of $140,000. I did add a couple of slides so we can show the comparison of what the current rates are versus the new recommended rates. Uh, originally, we had the same rate for single fam family and multifamily. Uh, we did uh, carve those out based on uh, the square footage of those uh, development units. Um, so they are different depending on single family versus multifamily. And then we also did add the multimodal improvement. Stephanie, just a, a slight um, clarification, the, di the difference between the single family and the multifamily fee is based on the household size of those dwelling types. If you could, just go ahead and identify yourself also. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Brian Duffany, Economic Planning Systems, the consultant that worked with Tiffany on the impact fee study. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I asked him to correct me if I say anything wrong, which I do quite often, so appreciate that, Brian. No problem. Brian, can you repeat what you were saying? Yes. Um, um, the the differences in the current and the recommended fees here between single family 
and multiple dwelling units um, is reflected in the, the fact that um, single family homes on average have a larger household size than multiple uh, family, than multiple dwelling units, you know, apartments and, and smaller attached dwellings. So the, the, the fees are, the fees use a per capita based formula. And so then uh, unit types with larger household size, size will, will pay more than units with, with typically smaller household sizes. So it's a more proportional, it's a more proportional impact fee compared to the, the, the previous fees, which were a flat fee per unit. Okay, so when we're looking at non-residential, um, again, I wanted to reflect what the current uh, rate is per square foot and then what the new rate would be. And uh, one significant change is previously non-residential was uh, grouped as one fee, and we have split this out based on that chip ge trip generation uh, data that we collected. Um, the idea is that depending on the type of development, they have different impacts on uh, the city, and so it's... Uh, only right that we charge a different uh, impact fee based on that trip generation. Um, hence the reason retail is uh, commercial is uh, more than maybe industrial or one of the other developments. And um, in the end, you know, the alternatives are uh, approve the amendments as proposed. Um, or maybe not make any changes at this time. I think the report definitely supports an increase or decrease depending on the type of development on the impact fees, and uh, we do support uh, approving these amendments. And if you have any questions, Brian is here as well as myself and uh, any others that you might uh, have questions of. Great, thank you. Council, we can, let's start with Council Member Elrod, then we'll go to uh, Trisco. Thank you. Thank you, um, Tiffany and Brian. Um, and I appreciate the change in the phasing in for the multimodal. Um, one of the graphs that you showed before that was very telling was where we stood compared to surrounding jurisdictions. And in particular for commercial, the non-residential, we were kind of way out of the ballpark. We were not being competitive with um, the surrounding areas. Do you have a sense now, at least with this phasing, what, you know, what that might look like? Are we still um, above in impact fees versus, to a lesser degree, but are we still above um, some of our surrounding jurisdictions? Yeah, I think, Brian, I don't know if you have that information handy. Um, if you give me a couple minutes I can look at that I, it was not a comparison um, I apologize we should have anticipated doing that that type of comparison to answer that question um, so I could look at that and um, see if I can make a quick uh, quick gauge of that based on the phase in schedule I'm uh, makes me a little bit nervous to try to do math on the uh, sort of on the podium on the fly um, no, no worries and if you don't have it you don't have it That's I'll fine. take a look Well, if it's going to take you a minute, why don't we move on? Do you have another question, sure. Karina? Okay. All right. Let's go to Council Member Driscoll. Yes, Tiffany, uh, this uh, kicks in year one. Um, okay. When does year one begin? Essentially, it would be, what is it, effective seven days after the approval of the ordinance? Okay. All right. It, seven days after publication, so technically it would be a week from Thursday if okay. Council approved it tonight. Great. Thank you. Council Member Grove. Uh, Microphone. Sorry, quick question. Uh, so year three, that's 100%? Yes, correct. Okay, and that will continue on. Okay, thank you. Great. I have a question for our city attorney. And are these fees that you can justify if you had to? Yes, Mayor. Great, thank you. All right. Do we have a, an answer yet, Brian? Were you able to find something? Um, I, I don't at the moment. It's, it, would, it would take me a little bit. I, I do think the, the phase in... I do think the phase-in schedule, um, that's something Tiffany and I worked on um, and thought pretty hard about. I think, that's, I think that, is, that is definitely a recommendation um, coming from both the consultant and staff um, because it will allow the market some time to adjust um, to, the, uh, to the new multimodal fee, which was you know, the, 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 
um, at, at its maximum level is 91 cents a square foot. So almost a dollar per square foot additional um, and phasing it in at that 30 cent level and then, and then moving up to 60 cents and 91 cents, I think will help to mitigate that. Council member Milliman. Uh, Brian, is that page 47 of the, the EPS document? For the comparisons? Most, most likely. Let me uh, look here. Or at least it talks about single family, then multifamily. Retail. Yeah, we, we, um, we provided some summary charts in the council presentation on the, on the, I think it was the, I can't find the date of that. Um, the March 9th. March 9th, okay. Uh, so just a moment here. There's some retail. So. Sorry, I apologize. That's okay. I would agree. Uh, page 47, I, I agree. I think that does a pretty good job with uh, with it uh, proposed. We go to 21,322, looking at Aurora, Brighton, Castle Rock. We're, we're, we're still on the low side uh, for the most part compared to those other cities, uh, Centennial, Westminster. So I think that does a pretty good job. Yeah, March 9th, page 14 Take. starts the comparison. Actually, page 13 of the presentation of the March 9th. March 9th, yes. Well, I'm, I'm trying to tease out the non-residential, the non-residential comparison, which is a little more, a little more complicated here. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Is Fay, the yeah. information that's being asked for, is it important for making the decision or is, is, it, is it important for making this decision? Could well, we the question was asked. from both Council Member Milliman and, and uh, Elrod about whether this is critical information worth our time or is it not? It's an indicator. The, the, the question uh, was asked, I think, by Council Member Elrod and I think she's uh, entitled to an answer. It's an indicator of how we compete in the general market. That was the reason for the question. Yeah, but my question is, I understand why. I am now, now what I'm wondering, and my question also is valid, is this essential information for making a decision right now? Because we have a decision before us, yes or no. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it is. Council Member Elrod, is this critical for making a decision? Your um, decision? Council Member Faye, thank you. And Council Member Elrod is waiting for her answer. Thank you. <clears throat> Do, Council, are there any other questions or are you ready? Unfortunately, we don't have an answer to that immediately, okay. so I know but, Brian is okay. looking at that. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and move do, do on? You, I think we're just going to have to move on, unfortunately. Yeah, so. So, I'm, so I'm just asking, generally, do you think this is significant enough of a change that it um, changes the comparison that we have versus the surrounding area? Are we still higher? Maybe by a lesser degree, but still higher. Yeah. Yes, generally. I think you'll still generally. be higher by it, but by a lesser degree. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Great. Mayor Oscar right. Driscoll. More concise. I see Pam's lit, Pam. lit up there. Did you have a question, Pam? Uh, no, I, I guess the charts that you gave us in May 9th, which is going back, and I don't know if I can go back, are at the full 100% level. Correct. Okay. Yes. So these would not be appropriate for year one and year two because they're only at a partial. Yeah, so I think if you're looking at that, it's going to be less, certainly less, right. because we're doing the phase in. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Council Member Driscoll. Yes, I move to approve Ordinance 10-2021 uh, on second reading, amending Title I, Chapter 14, regarding land development impact fees. Second. We have a motion and a second by Mayor Pro Tem. Um, 
Excuse me, Mayor. We have not opened or opened the public hearing yet. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can still read, we're, can still we're, read the motion. Yeah, she can, he can still read the motion. Uh, uh, Samuel Fox, if you would please tell the audience how they can participate. Everything's Thank thrown you, Mayor. off a little bit here. Reminder to citizens wishing to speak during the public hearing tonight who have not already joined our queue should please call six six nine. 9006833 and when prompted enter the webinar ID 9655608890. Please stand the line and press star 9 to be recognized for public comment. All right, thank you. And we do have by the way, we do have a motion and a second on the table, so but we are now uh, going to go into our questions. Uh, Sam, do we have anybody online? Thank you. I'd just like to make one final reminder to our callers. If you'd like to speak on this topic, please press star nine now. Again, that would be star nine to raise your hand if you'd like to speak on this topic. <clears throat> Mayor, if I can just give them anyone who's listening and calling in a second to catch up here. You bet. You bet. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands. All right. Well, I will open and close the public uh, hearing at 717. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Council, any other discussion? We have a uh, council member Elrod. Um, I have, um, you know, I, I expressed concern on um, the impact this had to retail, given that retail is looking to recover, right? And they're having to recover from a lot. And when we look at the the, the change that is happening, even in year one, even with um, some of the phasing in, which I think is um, is uh, a really great avenue um, of, of how we're implementing that. But we are still going up about, um, I think it's 30 plus percent um, in fees for retail, going from a 3.8 to a 5.8. And then in year three, I think it's closer to 60% if my quick math was right. So just for retail, I think that's where still my concern lies because that's still um, somewhat of an outlier um, that it's a significant jump for that sector in particular from where they are today. I am going to be proposing an amendment if you'd like me to propose that now. If you can hang on just one, it will go, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I suppose I just want to be clear for my own sake that um, <clears throat> this isn't a tax on existing retail in any way, right? Impact fees have to do with prospective development. And I think that the um, phased in approach uh, addresses council's concerns or some of council's concerns from the March 9th meeting and, and strikes a pretty uh, healthy balance between uh, giving the retail sector uh, necessary notice and runway so that they're not overwhelmed with with a giant leap in impact fees. Uh, balancing that with with what I read in, in this staff, um, the staff report on this that, that says, um, based on recent experiences with Breckenridge Brewery and King Supers, the city's economic development strategy will include a series of incentives. Impact fees have had little to no impact on retailer decisions to move forward with a project in the city. The most important incentive has been the city's willingness to consider a sales tax share back. So we will still make robust efforts as a city to, um, to attract retail through sales tax share back uh, as, as we have done. Uh, and in the meantime, we can put in place an impact fee policy that, um, that lets development pay its own way. That was the whole point of this. Uh, that's, that's my... Um, that's my focus still, and I think that uh, the the policy the ordinance has proposed um, it, it hits all those hits all those marks. So I'm I'm going to support this as as proposed. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Elrod. Um, my amendment will be a motion to amend. Hold on. A motion to amend Ordinance 10 2021 um, regarding land development impact fees for retail, uh, new retail impact fees to become effective one year from when it is approved. So instead of starting in year one, it would start in year two. So just looking to push that out one year to allow for recovery of retail this year. We have a motion. 
Do we have a second? No second. We have a motion and a second by Council Member Driscoll. All right. Uh, first, I'll go up, and then it'll be Council Member Fay. Uh, impact fees is something that we have talked about for years about bringing them up a little bit. It's it is for the new developments uh, to pay something into the system that we currently already have. Uh, it's something that our, our city attorney has said he can justify the fees. Um, so it, it is something that it, it, it is needed. We've been way behind this ball for a long time. And I do appreciate uh, Council Member Elrod's amendment on this. Uh, Council Member Fay. Um, yeah, we've been talking about the, the fees for a long time, two councils worth at least. And we were concerned a number of years ago uh, with the previous council that we were behind on this. I, I would like to uh, iterate what um, Scott said about this is for future development, upcoming development, not trying to help existing businesses who suffered through the COVID crisis. So um, I, in, in a lot of ways, in every way I can think of, this would not apply to the COVID pandemic and the effect it had. So we're talking about moving forward. I'm for it. Let's get it done. Anyone else? All right, we have a, a, an amendment on the table to delay or to omit year one, but started in year two, and then year three, it would be full. So the first year would be zero, second year, uh, whatever the amount is. Just phase in starting year two, so the 30. For the three years, okay, mm -hmm. so, that, that, so uh, that's, you just said retail only? For retail only. Okay, so that's the amendment. Uh, uh, City Clerk, could you read back the amendment, please? I'll do my best, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Elrod moved and Council Member Driscoll seconded uh, to amend Ordinance 10 2021 regarding land development impact fees related to retail to become effective one year from when it is approved. Uh, for example, year two instead of year one. Can I, sorry, before um, there's a vote on that, can I just make a comment? Please. Um, so, uh, Council Member Elrod, are you indicating just on retail, just for multimodal? Okay, I just want to kind of clarify one thing. Um, uh, one of the reasons that we chose to phase in the multimodal portion is to maintain the equity amongst all of the non-commercial um, uh, areas or, or developments. I think I would caution if you want to make an adjustment just to retail um, because you do impact that. So if you, I would recommend that if you're gonna do uh, a, a different phase in, you do it for multimodal for all of so the- let, let me try to simplify. Sorry that okay. I didn't get this to you guys earlier. So um, looking at this, the change from current to future. So currently it's 3.827 mm -hmm. um, for all non-residential. So a retail business today would pay 3.827. A retail business seven days from now, um, or whatever it is, would pay 5.08. What I am, um, uh, so a, a way to um, minimize that change or to not have that change in this given year, what I'm asking is for the new impact fees across the board, so not specific to multimodal, across the board, become effective one year from now. So it starts for retail next year as opposed to starting this year. No, no other changes other than the timing of implementation. Okay. An additional year phase in time for all non-residential fees. Retail only. And I think that's where the concern is if you single out just retail. Okay, I'll pull my minute. I'll second. All right. <laughs> Do uh, the motion was made and seconded. Does the rest of the council have to? Uh, I think we have to vote on that. That's correct. No, the, yeah. the seconder withdrew as well. But, that, but it was already seconded and sent to the full council. That's the issue. Correct. And Council Member Elrod has moved to withdraw her amendment. Uh, that was concurred with or seconded by uh, Council Member Driscoll. And so when we're pulling a motion that's on the table, which would be that amendment, we need a vote by council. So. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So a, a, uh, 
Hey, it's okay. <laughs> this isn't your first time, Karina. <laughs> okay, so council, what we are, we have a new motion to withdraw the amended motion. Okay, so a yes vote is to remove the amended motion, and then we are just left with the main motion. All right. A no is to want the amendment. Okay. So a thumbs, a thumbs up Can is I? to remove it. Sorry, can I clarify? I thought that the person who made the motion, at least under our legislative rules, the person who made the motion can withdraw it with a second without a council vote. Is that accurate? It actually requires a council it vote. It requires a council vote. Okay, yeah, my, my mistake. Yeah, a second Got moves it. it all to council. Okay. Cool. All right. All right, so does council, does everyone understand this? So a thumbs up is to remove, a thumbs down is to keep. All righty, vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion to withdraw carries them. Great. Unanimously. So we are we are now back to our main motion. And council, are you ready to vote? Great. Let's vote. Uh, uh, could you read the motion one more time, City Clerk? Absolutely. Uh, a motion was made to approve. Or I'm sorry. Let me. Um, council Member Driscoll moved and Mayor Pro Tem Malin seconded to approve Ordinance 10-2021. On second reading, amending Title I, Chapter 14 regarding land development impact fees. Great. Thank you. Council, ready? Vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Great. Thank you, Council. This night is not going smoothly. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to our. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Tiff. All right, we're going to move on to our next item, which is. Item 9B, ordinance number 04-2021, an ordinance on second reading approving the second amendment. Uh, wait, pardon me a second. Did we already do a... No, that was, that was C, wasn't it? No, I, I take that back. Okay, I'm back. Ordinance number... 04-2021, an ordinance on second reading approving the second amendment to the Santa Fe Park plan development and amending the official zoning map accordingly. All right, so council, if you remember, we did address this for the first time, April 20 of 21, that was two weeks ago, and, it is, and we continued it at that time. Uh, see, during that meeting, uh, the main discussion as after we had a motion, we had a motion in a second, a motion by Council Member Driscoll and a second by Valdez. And then as, the, as we discussed a little bit more about the parking, we decided that we needed more information at that time. The city was going to help us out there. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over. I'm going to turn it to the city attorney. Yes, correct, Mayor. Uh, you are correct. At the uh, 420 hearing, we had a motion to approve accepting out uh, condition 1.2, which was related uh, predominantly to parking, uh, two per 1,000 square feet, two surface parking per 1,000 square feet. And Council Member Driscoll uh, accepted out that with the main motion. That was seconded by you, Mayor. Um, and then it led to a discussion among uh, Council. And during that discussion, it became pretty evident uh, based upon comments from a few of the council members that there were some questions related to, well, what happens with parking now? Um, so it was decided by council, or at least the direction that staff received at that time was to, uh, staff gave an indication that perhaps there was some room to work with the applicant in clarifying that condition related to parking. I can tell you that staff and the applicant have worked over the last two weeks to come to a compromise and a new 1.2 condition that is currently uh, in the ordinance that should be in your packets. Um, to make things go as smoothly as possible, because we have a motion uh, that was tabled to this date, so that was the other part. We, we did a motion to table to the May 4th while staff and the applicant work to provide some clarification to council regarding that condition. But because we already have a motion in the second, if council is so inclined to hear a presentation um, from staff and perhaps the applicant and consider the new condition, what would need to be done is uh, a motion would need to be made to pull that main motion that, I, that 
uh, Councilmember Driscoll uh, made that would have to be seconded by uh, the mayor who seconded uh, on the April 20th and a vote by council. Following that, you could then reopen the public hearing mayor and allow staff to present on what this new condition is. Um, once staff has, uh, we, and we would be back to how we would typically do a, a public hearing. So we'd reopen the public hearing, staff would present um, as to what this new uh, parking related compromise is. Uh, we would open it up to public comment. So those uh, persons listening who wanted to call in to chime in on this could certainly do so. Uh, we'd go about closing that and and proceed as normal. So the first step right now, if council wishes to hear about the the compromised 1.2 conditions, is council member Driscoll would have to move to withdraw his motion. Great. And I'm going to ask for that in just one second. I just want to remind the caller that had called in earlier that this is the item that you had called in about. Uh, so when the public hearing is open, that'll be your opportunity. And uh, Council Member Driscoll? Yes, Mayor. I, I move to withdraw my main motion. And I agree. So we'll put it to a vote again. So Council, this is something that we just did a few minutes ago, but not as confusing, I don't think. So this is a motion to remove the motion, the main motion that was made <laughs> two weeks ago. So a, a yes vote is to remove it, and a no vote is to keep it. All right. So is everybody clear? All right. Ready? Vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion to withdraw the main motion carried unanimously. Great, thank you. And, and Sam Fox, oh. if you could please inform our audience again how they can. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Excuse me, just one second, Council Member Fay. Sam Fox, if you could please inform the audience how they can participate. Thank you, Mayor. Reminder to citizens wishing to speak during the public hearing tonight who have not already joined our queue to please call 669 900 6833. When prompted, enter the webinar ID 965-5608-8904. Please stay on the line and press star nine to raise your hand and be recognized for public comment. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I've already read the ordinance, so we don't need to go there again. Mr. Uh, Mayor, so you had said when I tried to deliver my council comment that I would instead speak after the attorney. Um, that, that, that is right. untrue. Council Member Fay, if you could please hold off. We haven't gone to council questions yet, so if you could please. Just... This isn't a council question. It was okay, a council okay, comment. Go ahead, Council Member Fay, speak. What I wanted to say, and this is for the benefit of citizens who are trying to follow this, is that our decision tonight is not, cannot be, because of law, about whether or not the developer can develop multifamily housing or retail on this property. It's not about whether it's going to be open space or not. We cannot decide that. And it's not about whether the traffic at the intersection is part of the decision. All this was decided back in the mid eighties. And so what I wanna make clear for the citizens, because it's been really confusing for all of us all the way through here, is these are not decisions that council can make right now. Those decisions were made back in the mid eighties, 35 to 40 years ago, that this property is zoned PDC. So that's planned development commercial. The developer can develop property. We don't get to decide on that tonight. So what I'm asking citizens to hear and to understand is that council cannot decide anything other than can the developer have the changes that the developer is requesting from us. And those were made pretty clear two weeks ago. It's kind of like if for all of us who have our residential property that was probably zoned for some of us back in the mid 80s, it was zoned as it was zoned then and we count on it to stay that for as long as we own it. And whether citizens or I or any other members of council or staff want it to be something else or we want it to be what the developer wants, it is zoned the way it is. And we all we can do is make the changes that the developer is asking for or not. That's all we can decide tonight. Thanks. All right. uh, acting city. Oh, I'm sorry. One more. Uh, 
Mayor Pro Tem would like to. Yeah, say, Mayor, can I just make a quick in? quick suggestion? I'm not sure what access the public has had to the new condition. Would it make more sense to uh, have callers call in after the staff presentation? Th that's exactly what we're doing. Okay. If, if I'm trying to stick to the agenda, Council Member Fay interrupted the agenda, so I'm getting back to it. So what we're going to do now is we'll have a staff presentation, then we go into public hearing. Sounds that, good. That, that is our process. Thank you. Cool. Mr. Mayor, gonna... I interrupted only because you interrupted my council comment. I'll turn it over to the acting city manager, please. Thank you, Mayor. I'm actually going to call in our community uh, yeah. development cool. director, Jennifer Henninger, to make the staff presentation. Thanks, Jen. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, Council, for the opportunity to come back before you. Um, as Reed stated, we got direction from you all to work with the applicant to figure out this parking condition. We understand that it was a little confusing. Um, we have spent these last two weeks working very closely with a developer, working very, very closely with staff internally to see what would work. So what we're going to present, Mike's gonna be the PowerPoint runner, is an explanation of how we got to these conditions and what they are. So first, just a, a quick reminder um, and Council Member Faye kind of set the stage a little bit, is the current PD um, from 1985 does have zoning on it already, and it is not for open space. Um, it is for high density. Um, it was a plan that covered, um, at first, over 100 acres. So we're only talking about 33 of those acres this evening. So, go ahead, slide. What can be built and some of the uses that could go in there today without this PD amendment are a transit passenger terminal, extraction of commercial mineral deposits, assembly plants, um, over, a million uh, over a million square feet um, of commercial space. That would be the entire 100 acres. Um, and also close to 1,000 residential units. So that is what is permitted now. When you're looking at the height setbacks and right of way established in the 1985 PD, you're looking at maximum building heights of 70. What's now being proposed is 60 on average. On the South Platte Park setback, currently it is a five foot setback. And what we've worked closely with the applicant as well as South Suburban um, is to have a 50 foot average buffer along with a 12 foot paved path. On along the Platte River Parkway right away, um, the current uh, setbacks that we are, the current width that would be permitted is 80. And due to um, a regional impact of traffic, as we discovered doing the traffic study of this entire project, um, that right away needs to be larger. Um, so what is being proposed is between 80 and 135. And then for the Nichols Street right away, Current is 80, and what's being proposed is 94 to 100 feet. And again, that's accommodating regional traffic. So what's before you this evening, um, as it was on the 20th of April, is a narrow request on three items um, for this PD. What they're requesting is to change the location permitted for multifamily uses. Um, in changing that, because right now the multifamily uses are only permitted along Santa Fe, and in respecting the river, we feel that moving the residential closer to the river rather than having commercial along the river is better for the habitat there. Then they've also requested to allow for senior living and assisted living uses. This is not a use that's currently contemplated in the PD, and therefore we take the position if it's not in the PD, it's not a use permitted. So they're specifically asking for senior living and assisted living uses. Um, I can tell you from the planning perspective, um, it is at least one call a week that we get for senior living, request for senior living in Littleton, because we have a lot of people that want to stay in Littleton but can't stay in their house anymore. The other part of it is establishing new setbacks, lot and design standards. Attached in your packet was a 56-page design standard document. Um, 
we have worked um, probably for three years with, <laughs> with a developer on getting these types of standards because we know that this is a, a property that means a lot to this community. So we wanted to make sure it had the right look um, for what we wanted at that property. So you know, I encourage you to take a look at those and that's part of what is being requested tonight is those new design standards. So what we arrived at the last two weeks pertaining to parking is now summarized in your ordinance that you have before you as a three part, three parts to 1.2. So prior to this, we had a 1.2 condition of two surface, two surface parking spaces per thousand. And working with a developer, looking, with, looking at data both on the traffic side um, the land design side, um, what market is looking for in terms of parking. We went back to the seven per thousand uh, surface parking spaces. And this is in alignment with the PC recommendation um, from December and January. So that is expressed in 1.2A in the conditions before you. 1.2B gets at the following bullet point, and that is encouraging and um, requiring public-private funding coordination for parking structures. As we started in our conversation last time that we were here, um, we talked about the need for RTD to be part of this, or a private enterprise, um, as well as the developer and partnerships that needed to happen to make a parking garage happen. So we have gotten commitment from the developer to um, not only try to accommodate that, um, but also to partner in um, the funding of that. The next one, a 1.2C, deals with the last two bullet points, and that's a promise on the part of the applicant to dedicate land for a pedestrian bridge landing, and that would be uh, memorialized in a future subdivision improvement agreement, that's what SIA is, um, that would come with a future plat. And then also the requirement that all future site development plans, because if you remember, anything that happens on the site will have to go through a future site development plan. Um, so uh, the basically agreeing that all site development plans in the future will accommodate a parking structure, or at least the design for a parking structure. So in doing some of our calculations and trying to arrive to the, um, the conditions that you have before you this evening, the revised condition, we took a look at um, what we call our walk shed. Um, so when you are at a transit station, something that we like to do is try to design so for walkability. And then you have your quarter mile walk shed is what we call it. So if you leave, um, it's not even the platform, but kind of the edge, um, once you get across Mineral and you walk a quarter of a mile, you actually arrive in, uh, we'll call it the back 40, right, of the RTD parking lot. Um, and actually, go back for a second. So just to give you an idea, you know, because we've been talking about service parking. So, let me see. In total, what you see there is 1,200 parking spaces um, represented on the concrete as well as the asphalt. The red box that you see is the same footprint as the first bank center parking structure, um, which is, it's, it's up um, in Broomfield, thank you, um, by the first bank center. Um, and it is a private-public partnership and has RTD spaces as well as public parking spaces. That red rectangle, that footprint, represents 1,500 parking spaces. So the next slide, the yellow line, indicates that same distance but going to the south onto the Evergreen property. The orange line on this, um, the two orange lines in the circle, um, represent the future quad road. So as you can see, the yellow line lands squarely in the Harvest District. That's the commercial district of the proposed PD amendment. So in working with the developer as to where a possible parking garage could go, 
the agreement was made north of Nichols in the Harvest District. So it would meet that quarter mile walk shed from the RTD station. So in short, um, with our new recommendations, um, we still feel that the PD amendment is better suited to where we are as a city right now. Um, the decreased number of residential units proposed as well as the decreased height um, are more in character with the city. The robust design standards that we were able to get with this PD amendment better meet the needs of our community and the look that we would want at that location. And then in this, we were able to use our new economic fiscal analysis to really get to what uses needed to go there. And what's reflected in the PD amendment is those uses that we find that are going to be best economically for the city. The new conditions, so the 1.A, or yes, 1.2A, 1.2B, and 1.2C promote more walkability and TOD design that are in agreement with the station area master framework. And also the condition matches the PC recommendation. So this concludes staff comments and I can take any questions should you have any. Great, thank you very much. Did the uh, developer want to make any comment at this point? Uh, the only comment I'd like to make is just to express gratitude again with staff. <laughs> this is what this process is all about. You know, we come across obstacles, whether it's a quad road or a wetlands or a floodplain or parking, and we roll up our sleeves and we sit down and we collaborate. Um, and it's been, and this project has had more collaboration because it's had, frankly, more problems, but just continue to be really just wowed and grateful for the time. I mean, Jennifer uh, sacrificed some personal family time with stuff going on to be there. We had to put Mark on a talking head um, <coughs> a laptop, excuse me, so he could participate remotely. <laughs> um, but the lengths to which your staff goes to, to work hard with property owners like ourselves is really, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. So I'm just grateful and thank you again for giving us the opportunity and I will not subject you to another full presentation tonight. All right, well thank you very much. Thank you. All right, before we get into council questions, Sam Fox, if you could please remind our callers how they can participate again. Of course, citizens wishing to speak during the public hearing tonight who are not already in the queue should please press 669-900-6833. And when prompted, use the webinar ID 965-5608. 8904. Please stay on the line and press star 9 now to raise your hand to be recognized. Right. Thanks, Emma. If we don't have any questions at the moment, then we'll go right into the public hearing. So I will open the public hearing. It is 749. Sam, do we have any callers? Thank you. We'll start with caller 500. Caller 500 is now your turn to speak. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself and begin speaking. Thanks for hanging in there, Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. That was caller 500. You can go ahead and press star 6 to unmute yourself and begin speaking. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sounds like a Verizon commercial. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Council, uh, for hearing me. Uh, and. I'd also like the developer to uh, respond to this, if you could, or at least take note of it. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an attorney. Uh, I've lived at uh, 6330 South Ponds Way in Columbine Lakes for nearly 25 years, <clears throat> where Wilder Elementary is located. So what we have is we have a really kind of a catastrophic problem right now um, with all of the developments feeding into our school that's uh, located within, it's not located on our property, but we there's an easement that provides access into our private community and private roads to the Wilder Elementary. So the easement is pretty specific uh, that it allows access to uh, the tract of land where Wilder is located, yet now we have traffic coming in our north entrance and going through the loop, we have two entrances to our community. 
So between two and three in the afternoon and about eight and nine every day, we have a continuous loop of traffic from, you know, Columbine Country Club, the Hamlet, um, Beaumont South, uh, uh, Burning Tree, uh, Meadowbrook, and now River Park. Because I understand River, River Park, River, River Park will feed into Wilder. And I think what I saw in the proposal was 260 residential units in River Park. I could be. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. I couldn't. Sorry, that's my watch talking to me. Um, <laughs> can everyone see it? So um, I guess Siri is as interested in this as I am. Uh, so I think there's 260 residential units uh, from River Park. Uh, I could be wrong. But that's, interestingly enough, about the same amount of residential units in Columbine Lakes. Uh, 215 townhouses, uh, 60 single families, and I'm in a single family in the back. So there's no more room at the end for River Park's students. And yet we hear that the developer, just like the developer for the mid-century homes across the street, just like the development that's going in uh, along Platte Canyon, um, uh, a little bit to the south of Bowles. <coughs> We're always hearing how closely the developers worked with Littleton Public Schools and planners, planners about how the, there's capacity. 30 seconds. For, there's capacity. There's no more capacity. We're beyond capacity. So I submit it's really a myth that there's some study of capacity for Wilder to uh, accept all another 260 residents with children. And I, I, I think it's a, a defective plan, a defective development plan based on that alone. That's time. Great. Thank you very much. And that was Jeff Kelly. All right, Sama, next caller, please. Thank you. Our next caller will be caller 110. Caller 110, it is now your turn to speak. Please press star six to unmute yourself and begin speaking. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey, this is Brianna Atherton and I'm the president of the Columbine Lake Maintenance Association. And um, I live at 4216 West Pondview Place. Um, and I'll just further a little bit to Jeff's comment. Um, you know, Wilder currently brings in nine buses a day through our neighborhood. And, you know, while the single family traffic is a problem, a very substantial problem and inconvenience to our neighborhood, the buses do a substantial amount of damage to our roads. You know, as our community was built in the late 1970s, and as you can imagine, we're at the end of the useful life. Um, we do not receive any funding for a wrap from Arapahoe County or from the city of Littleton. And Littleton Public Schools provides us a paltry $2,000 a year to, for the damage that they do to our roads. And what I would like to know is, is there been a projection for how many elementary aged children would be at River Park? And are they going to have a dedicated bus which would add a 10th bus, bus to the circuit going to Wilder. Um, and I hear the argument that Wilder's capped at 650 and that, you know, what will happen is they'll just kick out, you know, opt-in kids for in-district kids. Uh, the problem with that from a damage perspective is that the more in-district children there are, that means the more buses that are going to our neighborhood. And, you know, dovetailing to your guys' discussion of you just talked about impact fees, you know, this development is causing damage to our neighborhood. And unfortunately, we have no means to collect any kind of impact fee. Um, and we just have to keep taking this massive residential growth. I mean, while Plum just came in, Wilder Lane, Willowcroft, Millbrook, or Millstone, or whatever it's called, and now River Park. So while fundamentally, as a resident of, of, of this area, I don't have a problem with the River Park development, but I do think that our community needs to be compensated for the, the expansive growth in residential and the damage that it's doing to our roads. Um, so we are working with Arapahoe County and uh, Commissioner Warren Gulley, um, and we have had some discussions with LPS. Um, 
we're not making a lot of movement there. And I would ask this city council if you can help us with discussions with LPS, because in all honesty, we're moving towards a legal fight with them and seconds. shutting off access to our neighborhood. Um, this is a serious problem for a very small community that cannot afford to continue to foot the bill for the larger LPS and Littleton community. Great. Well, thank you, Brianna, for your comments. Sam, my next caller, please. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to remind any callers in the queue who have not already raised your hand, please press star nine if you'd like to be recognized to speak on this topic. Our next caller will be caller 493. Caller 493, it is now your turn to speak. Please press star six to unmute yourself and begin speaking. Good evening, City Council. Uh, my question, this is Frank Atwood in District 4, and my question is with regards to the parking structure and the pedestrian overpass, will they be built as first construction in the development of Enzor North, seeing as uh, the rest of the construction and the plans are contingent on uh, the parking structure and pedestrian pass. So I hope that City Council insists on uh, the parking structure and the pedestrian overpass being built first as obvious good faith on the developer's part for uh, being part of our community. Thank you very much. Frank Atwood. Thank you, Frank. Sam, our next caller. Thank you. Our next caller will be caller 960. Caller 960, it is your turn to speak. Please press star six to unmute yourself and begin speaking. All right, caller 960. Hello. Caller 960, it looks like you need to press that. There we go. I see you're unmuted and you may begin speaking. Okay, Sam, do we have another caller and we can figure out 960 eventually? Of course. Let's go to caller 819. Caller 819, it is now your turn to speak. You may press star 6 to unmute yourself and begin speaking. I'm Hi, Council. This yeah. is Pam Chadbourne. I live in Council District 1. Um, I, I don't think you should approve this. I think you should get the developer to go back and to go back to zero and work with staff and staff as well. Um, and this shows the poverty of our, the, the lack of any real understandable planning uh, by the city on the city's behalf. So let's just go to schools. I have said this many, many times over the past many years. Um, what planning should do, what, let's be clear, city planning should do is plan for the city. In other words, how does each new proposal fit into the city's plan for schools and groceries and traffic and parking and residential balance and all of those things? And you know, staff started out with nothing and is ending up with a huge concession to a developer, which you should not approve. Um, I, I think the folks to the West need to understand that the rezoning in the 80s, and I'll remind you folks, as Councilor Ruffay did, that the rezoning in the 80s was in exchange for mineral going west. And old man answer was a developer, and he knew what he was doing, and he got a great deal. But times have changed, and our city staff should have had an understanding of what the city gets from the, should get from this property um, before any developer walked in and before they started negotiations. And they should give you go and no-go go criteria, and us, and they don't have any of that. So you don't have the information you need to make this decision. Because you don't know whether this is going to really hurt and damage Littleton, not to mention surrounding communities, or not. The staff has given you not a thing about the impact of this 
on the city. You know, all that Jennifer could say is this fits the city now and looks good. And you heard this from the, from Keast. He said, we've been asked to look at what it looks like when it drives by. You know, Keast has not delivered you a thing about functionality and how this works with this city or the city of the future. It doesn't deliver affordable housing. It doesn't deliver um, maintainable and sustainable housing. It doesn't deliver a support for best use of the public transit. It doesn't give us any of the things we need. Yeah, Carol Fay is right. Um, you can either approve or disapprove the um, proposed rezoning, and you shouldn't because it doesn't help us out at all. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Sam, a next caller, please. Thank you. I'd like to try caller 960 again. Caller 960, it is your turn to speak. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself and begin speaking. All right. We're having trouble with that one, that's for sure. I look forward to when folks can start coming back into the chamber here. Sure. Just one more reminder. That's star six. There, I see you're unmuted. You may begin speaking. <laughs> All right. How are you doing Thank there, you very nine much. six? Council, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. My name is Jessica Anderson. I am calling from four three five two West Palmview Drive, and I would like to um, um, Brianna and Jeff called in regarding our roads, and I am the vice president of the HOA here. And with the COVID and all the parents driving their kids in, as well as the buses, our roads are in such disrepair. And with the added kids that will be coming from the new development, I am wondering if the council has considered um, providing us some support for our road to provide these buses, these parents, the additional traffic that will be coming through our association. And if possible, I would like to yield my time to Jeff or Brianna, just in case they have anything extra. No, we're unable to do that, sorry. Well, I appreciate your time. Great. Thank you very much, Jessica. Sama, do we have anyone else? Thank you, Mayor. That was our last caller with the hand raised to be recognized. Great. I will close the public hearing. It is 8.03. Council, well, before we go there, uh, do we have anything for the acting city manager or city attorney that you'd like to add? Nothing to add. Um, I didn't know if you wanted uh, an opportunity for staff and the applicant to respond to some of the questions that uh, during public comment. Okay. I was asking you first. I was getting there, too. Okay, cool. Nothing for you. Uh, staff? Thank you, Mayor. So in regards to the LPS question, when this um, proposal came through, we did refer it to LPS. Um, they had no comment on it. Um, we did talk to LPS when the Southern property um, came through and had submitted a site development plan application, and LPS had contemplated um, a potential new school site as well as ball fields um, on the south side, but have decided not to pursue that. Um, I will say, you know, should this move forward, when we do get a site development plan application um, from Evergreen, we will refer that out again to LPS um, and get their comments on that. Great, thank you. We actually, we actually met with the school district uh, at the beginning of our entitlement process, and same thing, LPS didn't have any concerns. Because of the nature of our multifamily, it's, it's going to be either senior housing, which doesn't have any children, or on the market rate housing, it'll be one and two bedroom units, which generally aren't favored by families. Um, you know, nationally, you uh, get a much lower school-aged child per unit in multifamily housing than you do in single family housing. So it definitely will not be one for one. And we're, we're leasing up two other projects, you know, right now in the city and the predominance are empty nesters and single females, to be honest with you, um, neither of which have children. Uh, so 
we would anticipate a very low you know, impact, but of course, when we go through the SDP with specific unit counts and things like that, we will work with the school district to make sure that their needs are accommodated. Great, thank you. Um, we'll start with the Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thanks, Mayor. <clears throat> I think this question is for Public Works. Um, I'm curious, uh, is this parking garage more than hypothetical? How's it gonna happen? Who are the partners gonna be? Uh, when's it gonna happen? Uh, I mean, what kind of a timeline is it on? Do we have any sense of kind of square footage? Uh, th those types of questions. Some lights are green, some lights are red for the microphones. Uh, the answer to that question is, frankly, I don't know. And the reason for that is because, uh, let's see, the RTD district to the north, as the mayor reported earlier, is in financial disarray. Um, the PEL study is not completed. Um, CDOT has not come to the table and frankly has not done a lot of investment in parking structures as of late, as far as I can tell around the state. Um, but from our perspective, it is in our best interest to continue to pursue opportunities. I can tell you that in the three years that I've been here, uh, myself and the city manager and some of the staff here, we spent a lot of time with RTD. Um, frankly, we could take the spots that they have out there and you could have 4,000 spots at that station right now with a parking structure. It's not our land though. And we don't have the ability to go build on it without their permission. So much like we're doing with all of our other projects, it's our intent to try and find partners to pursue projects of that nature. Um, I have put together several comparisons. Um, a pedestrian bridge would more than likely cost between nine and 10 million to span that road. Um, a parking structure that would be 150,000 square feet, which is hard to conceptualize because it comes in many different forms. Um, we've all been in different parking structures and the layout and the size and the, and the height is very much dependent upon the configuration of the roads and the accessibility to that site. Um, a 150,000 square foot parking garage on average in the United States, especially in the Rocky Mountain West, is about $9.7 million, not including the cost of land acquisition. Um, and that is on average. Generally speaking, a 150,000 square foot parking structure will house anywhere from 375 to 500 parking spaces, depending upon the configuration of those. We're seeing more parking structures now that include electric vehicle um, stations within the structures. Um, we've seen some of those, there's some of those in the tech center and in the landmark complex and a few other places. Um, so just like all of our other projects, you know, that would be a pedestrian bridge and a initial structure is 20 million bucks. You know, we, that's not something that we have. We would not take the lead on that. We would be a partner with other people to do that. Our first direction from a transportation perspective is to try and maximize our relationship with RTD. Um, they're going to be the one that drives our ability to create transit-oriented development. As a reminder, uh, a year ago or so, I shared with you all that um, RTD prepared a report showing which communities are most likely to partner with them in transit-oriented development. Of the 19 communities, we were ranked 19th last because we have a history of not doing that and not working with them as a partner from that perspective. So we're trying to change that. Uh, I know we spent a lot of time meeting with them. I feel strongly that we have the opportunity to build a partnership to deliver something really great out there um, and see where this goes. When we look at the discussions about Front Range Rail, two of the alignments show this as a station, mineral station, uh, potentially down there uh, along the freight alignment. So all those things are in play right now. There's a huge amount of federal dollars they're going to drop to rail in support of TOD here shortly. We'll see. So that's where we're headed in terms of direction. Um, but I can't guarantee any time frame or any design or any application of that at this time. Thanks. Great. Council, any other questions? Councilmember Grove. Maybe I missed it. Where would the land be for this parking structure? I mean, I, I saw that red thing. Is that, is it, but I didn't see the location. Right, so there, at this time there is not an exact location, um, you know, as part of the condition, it is uh, north of Nichols in the harvest area, so really, you know, in the inside of the quad road, if you will, abutting okay. Mineral and Santa Fe in that general area, but again, it, 
it has to do with who do our partners end up being. You know, if is it a private partnership? It is a hotel that comes in. Is it RTD? Um, is it part of the PEL? So it's the the exact location is TBD, and that's why we've asked for all site development plans that come in would contemplate a a location. So that would be set aside. Yes, um, through an STP. Okay, uh, kind of related. To, should I keep going? Yeah. Okay, kind of related to that is. Um, in the initial packet we had, um, the request was for 12 uh, parking spaces per 1,000. And now uh, you're at seven as a compromise. Is that going to severely impact what kind of commercial uses? And are we going to see less restaurants, more drive throughs I mean, what, what, what do you expect that the 12 versus a seven is going to do? That's a great question. So in the PD, there's still two different parking standards for the commercial. There's uh, the, the retail uh, standard, which is five per thousand. Then there's the restaurant fitness entertainment at 12 per thousand. So it really, and then what we're doing on top of those two standards is have an overall limitation of seven because there's gonna be a combination. We're not gonna do 100% restaurants or fitness. And, uh, and I also don't think we're gonna do 100% retail either, especially given where the retail world is at. And so what we, part of the reason why we work closely with staff is running many different scenarios of the mix of retail versus restaurant. And at what point do we hit these, start hitting the ceiling of the seven per thousand? And there are some scenarios that are very heavy on the entertainment restaurant fitness where we start to bump up against that threshold. But it's, it's an unlikely situation. And if we get an overabundance of restaurant entertainment interest and, you know, someone wants to come do a big entertainment venue, then we'll just come back before council and have that very user-specific discussion about why we need to maybe vary from that seven. But based upon our various um, scenarios, we believe that that seven per thousand threshold can accommodate the vast majority of the potential development options that we anticipate coming to River Park. So it'll just be a mix, and when it starts, the mix may not work, then it's another conversation or Correct. you look for other commercial. Yeah. Um, so how many, it, it's hard to see, because the rendering we have is just kind of, it, it, we don't know how many pads there are. How, mm -hmm. how many pads do you, how many commercial entities do you think will fit into this area that you have in this district now, minus the amount of land that you're going to give for the parking structure and the pedestrian bridge? You know, it, it's, it's hard to say right now because we haven't been able to officially market the property because I haven't had the zoning in place. And what I can say in the past is we've had interest from a variety of different categories. I have a lot of retail restaurant interest. Um, we've had primary employers express an interest in doing a you know, corporate headquarters with an office building, which that could be one scenario, Mayor Pro Tem, where private development could pay for the garage entirely. Because with a sufficient, certain amount of density, then the private world can pay for it. Um, if it's a, especially an office building or um, a, a hotel, as Jennifer mentioned. So it depends on if it ends up being driven by an office user, by you know, a, a retail, like a grocery anchor, would certainly impact how you lay the site out because they've got very specific requirements for uh, shopping cart accommodation and, and trucks and things of that nature. Or if we end up getting hospitality interest because of the proximity of the light rail, you know, that could impact you know, how it lays out. So we literally have probably 50 different site plan scenarios, all that work within the parameters of the zoning. And that's what, zoning is not a prescription for a specific building type or a specific site plan. It's creating the guardrails for quality development, and then we will work collaboratively with staff over the coming years based upon the interest that we've received to create the site plan. But in any event, we'll be planning to accommodate this, this garage or garages, potentially. And that's important because uh, it, it could be likely that we have some great users we want to get going with the initial phase and that the public-private partnership funding is not in place at that time for a garage. And so we plan a surface lot that can be converted to a structured parking down the road. Uh, and that happens quite frequently in urban infill areas where an, initial, an old surface lot then gets densified and that allows additional development to occur. Okay, and then um, I'd like to go back to the uh, residential area. Yeah. Uh, because we're still sitting at a half a 
parking spot per unit? No? No. Can you explain that? Because that's what I read. So I, I, is that beyond what is allowed for the residents? So it would go to the, the seven per thousand. So it's not per unit. This is the residential area. So in the residential area, what is on the PD will is, prevail, which will is prevail. correct. Which 1. is 1.5. 1.5 per unit. Per unit. Correct. And it, do you have garages underneath? Is that, or is we this do. all so for, so We do. So yeah, part of our garage, part of our buildings, it, um, every single building, I believe, has a, a parking structure, I guess, you know, incorporated into the ground level of those okay. buildings. So those multifamily units are already contemplated to have a structured parking because they're, they're built within the building. It's not a freestanding concrete structure, but it is parking incorporated into the actual residential buildings. So um, if somebody had three cars, whatever, there would be extra, that would be the seven spaces that they would have to park on some sort of surface parking. So there's surface parking in addition to the garages. Well, s similar to the commercial, there'll be an average. There'll, there'll be some people who don't have a car right. because there's a light rail across the street. You know, the vast majority will have one car, um, and then there'll be some who have two. I think it's, it's pretty unlikely that someone who has three cars is living in a multifamily unit. Right. Because they... I just want to make sure there's enough parking. That's that there's enough parking. So do we, yeah. It, yeah. But we're comfortable with the standards. I mean, the, the multifamily standards in the APDP, we worked very carefully with staff on for a long time to get that right because, as we mentioned two weeks ago, we won't have the ability, for better or worse, to spill over. You know, right. the, all the streets adjacent are high-speed arterials. There will ultimately be a quad road. You know, then there's the, the, the open space to the west. And so there's nowhere for parking to go. It has to be self-contained. So I, I stand corrected. So it's 1.5 per unit. Correct. And That's then there's it. additional parking, surface parking for spillover guests or whatever. Well, the, the, yeah, 1.5 per unit is for the, the district that's west of South Platte River Parkway, the residential area. Then the right. seven per thousand applies to everything that's between South Platte River and Santa Fe. Okay. So that harvest district. Because probably in the retirement um, community, there probably wouldn't be a lot of, I don't know what we call it, the senior community, there probably wouldn't be a lot of need for parking for that. Correct. There's less. Yes. And actually, we already know today that our senior housing group that would like to build in River Park, if we're lucky enough to get approved, is already planning on structured parking for that use. Uh, they're going to do tuck under parking underneath the building uh, uh, so that the vast majority of the senior parking will be underground, actually. Thank you very much. Councilmember Driscoll. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, staff and uh, Evergreen, for this compromise. I think it's a great uh, solution to what I envision just to being a really neat project. Um, um, I concur with what uh, Councilwoman Faye said. You know, we we don't have the choice. You know, a lot of the emails I got, and I'm sure the other council members got, was open space. Keep this open space. Well, this was never open space. Well, I guess it was back, <laughs> maybe with the American Indians, but. Uh, uh, this hasn't been open space, space forever, so uh, I, I hope the public realizes that what we're voting on tonight is really about a change of, of zoning. Um, and uh, again, I, as I said last week or two weeks ago, you know, what the developer is asking is, is very fair, and uh, I, I support uh, this change. Uh, just a quick um, note to our friends from Columbine Ponds. My kids also went to uh, Wilder, and um, for those people that don't know, <clears throat> you can go into um, littlegov.org and just click uh, click it and fix it. If you're really having some issues with your roads, uh, click there, and uh, if there's potholes or stuff that needs to be fixed, or work directly with the Public Works Department to help uh, help with your roads. But um, I appreciate the fact that you guys did meet with uh, Littleton Public Schools, uh, Wilder. I don't know if they were in that conversation or not, uh, but if they're at capacity at, as one caller said, 650, then. I guess they're at capacity at 650. I don't know unless they do a new addition. Uh, I think when my kids were going there, um, it, it, it was that number. Um, so I just thank you again, and I look forward to uh, moving forward. Wait, Mayor, can I can I just quick clarify? I mean, I appreciate the comments from the callers in West Pond Circle, but I don't believe that's in the city, is it? It is not. Oh, that's that's a private road. It's not gated.
Thank you, Keith. I don't want to sit on the attorney's, city attorney's lap. Um, those are not in the city, and they're also private roads. So the development is responsible for the maintenance of those roads. That would have been clarified in any uh, real estate closing documents they would have signed at the time of their property closing. Um, they're, less, they're not very common, frankly, in urban areas, in the county areas that are that, that model, but th that's the case in this particular development's model. I stand corrected. Thanks. So, Thank you. Right, take care of that. I, I have a comment, then we'll be uh, Council Member Elrod. So uh, I, I think last time you were here, you were told that you were being uncreative, unimaginative, and not forward thinking. I think if you weren't being imaginative and creative and forward thinking, we wouldn't be here tonight. I think what you took was the property that was there and how can you make it better. I think what you are doing because of this property, uh, what you're proposing, is it does help the intersection of, of Mineral and Santa Fe uh, with the turns that we have there. It, it doesn't, doesn't fix it, but it, I think it will improve it. I think that's a good thing. Um, I, I think talking about parking structure right now, building it first, is putting the, the, the cart before the horse. I mean, uh, the, perhaps we'll need that. Perhaps we won't need that someday. Um, also, I, I think we're, we're now with the Planning Commission recommendation which is, was it the one for 7,000, is it? So, uh, and, and the Planning Commission, uh, they really worked this thing over, and I think they worked you guys over. So uh, that's, because that's what they do, and they do a good job doing that, and they study these things. So um, I, I, I think this is a, a very good plan that you've put the, on the table for us. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Council Member Elrod was up next. Um, I have a couple Sorry. of follow-up questions. Um, coming back to the 1.5 in the residential units, um, the 1.5 per dwelling unit, is that all going to be accommodated in the tuck under parking, or is it some combination of tuck under parking and surface parking? It'll be a combination of three types of parking. So there'll be the tuck under parking that's within the building. There'll be some surface parking, and then there'll actually be detached garages as well that will be without residential above. So uh, three different formats of it, and it'll be a combination. Okay, and then this question is, might be for Keith. The quad road, looking at the illustrative plan, so this one, can someone bring this one up? Yes, hold on, we'll bring it up. So as you bring that up, um, if you could just point out the quad road um, area in particular, and can you talk a little bit about the traffic flow through there as far as speeds and volume to a certain degree or, or when there would be the greatest um, traffic um, in that area? Keith Reister, Public Works Director. I appreciate the chance to get a little work out in tonight. I haven't had a chance to do that tonight, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, re related to the quad road, um, much like the intersection is today, the highest flows are going to be in the AM and the PM peak. Um, you know, even with COVID, we're seeing um, consistent, most of the volumes today are close to pre-COVID AM peak, but they're stretched out in the PM peak hours. Um, so, you know, basically 7 to 9 and 3 to Depends on how long you sit in the intersection now, three to seven, three to eight. So, um, you know, realistically speaking, those will be the peak times. Uh, you know, the volumes currently through that intersection in the afternoon in the peaks are, thank you for pointing that out up there, that's the intersection. Um, <laughs> and so the flows, the, the cars will come through and then come around and, and come pointing up there at the thing. Do you want um, yeah, just... The easiest way to do this is you're gonna, you're going to come down in the picture on West Mineral. You're going to turn right onto Clever River Parkway. Thank you. I, the names are all kind of similar over in that neighborhood. And then you'll get to the roundabout there, and that traffic will flow then from there, either south into the other development, into this development, or east back to where you see the word South Santa Fe Drive, in which there's going to be a full access point there. Um, so the volumes in the afternoons... I'm trying to remember that detail of modeling. Do you have it? I, it's, it, there's going to be a lot of flow through there. 
I mean, but that's part of the objective, um, to relieve left-hand turning movements out of that intersection, which is where you gain time through the traffic circuits, through the intersection itself, through the lighting model. Um, there's good parts and there's challenging parts to that. Obviously, more um, volume creates you know, challenges for pedestrian movements. At the same time, it also is going to provide an opportunity for the commercial development within this site to see more pass-by traffic, which we talked about retailers earlier. I know from working with retailers in a lot of situations that the more pass-by traffic, the more opportunity they have. So um, I do not have an exact number off the top of my head in terms of that, but it, it, you're, you're all familiar with the intersection today. The most volume out of that intersection you'd see going through there would be probably 15% of the volume you see at any given time in the afternoon peak. So Keith, like Aaron, Aaron has, has, Aaron? has answered there would be a 550 one-way in PM peak. Okay. So just to make sure I followed the arrow. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're heading in the evening, when you're heading in the evening, um, the peak volume is heading south. Yes? Yes. Okay, and in order for, so, so if you're heading south on Santa Fe, then you're heading west on Mineral, going through Nichols Drive to continue south on Santa Fe? No. Okay, can, can, you, can you give me the arrow again? Where, when you say peak, what is happening? What volume from Santa Fe is being diverted to this development? From they're coming from mineral. They're 550 the cars an hour. They're coming. They're heading the east channel. on mineral. It, and, and some is going are going south. Some are going north. They'll, they'll be going south, and then they'll be making that turn to the north. You're taking that left hand signal time out of the intersection is where you gain time in an intersection. Is left hand turning movements take up your time. So you're. Someone heading east on Mineral is going to go north or south. If, if someone's going north on Santa Fe and they're heading east on Mineral, what is their path? They're going straight to Santa Fe and making a left. If they're coming north on Santa Fe, they're going to make a right-hand turn to go east. That movement won't change. Yeah. But this would be from the um, top right corner is northbound. The intersection, they're still going to go I'm, I'm simply trying to understand the traffic that's flowing through this area that's being diverted from either Santa Fe or Mineral, and I'm not understanding. Okay. So okay. We, we have a video <laughs> of how the quad road functions, but this, yeah. I, okay. um, I can, I well, I, do you want me to step in? I've had to, expl sure. I've had to explain this it. to a lot of brokers. <laughs> and I, I, can, I can have, is, is Aaron available? Aaron, Aaron had COVID before, and he's got a, he's quarantined. That's why he's. Oh, there he is. There he is. Our city Can you hear me? Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Can you guys hear me okay? Still wearing that mask, huh, Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> Can't nope. hear you. We just lost you. You're on mute. Okay. There you go. You can hear me now, though. Yes. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> I'd be happy to try and walk you through this. <laughs> um, so basically what we're doing is the quad road replaces the left turns at Santa Fe and Mineral. So if you today are going through the intersection and making a left turn, you'll no longer be able to do that at Santa Fe and Mineral. Instead, you'll be diverted to this quad road. And it depends on which direction you're coming from on how you will operate on the quad road. So for example, if you're headed south, on Santa Fe, and you want to turn left to go east under the railroad and to the developments in South Park and stuff, instead of making that left, what you would do is you'd continue through the intersection at Mineral, you'd make a right onto Nichols, you'd come around through the, the roundabouts in the development, come back up to Mineral, make a right onto Mineral, and head back through the intersection again to go eastbound on Mineral. Now that's kind of the extreme of the out of the way you'd, you'd incur. A better example of how it won't really affect traffic is if you're headed northbound on Santa Fe. And let's say you wanna to go to the west 
on mineral. Do you want to head over the South Platte River Bridge? Now, instead of turning at mineral, you turn ahead of time onto Nichols. One block earlier, you'd make your way along Nichols through the roundabout up to mineral and then make a left on Platte River Parkway onto mineral and head west from there. So you'd just be turning a little early and following the quad road. And the way this is going to work, the traffic study that we did, and it was a very extensive traffic study. I know Tyler will, will back me up on that, right, Tyler? Um, <laughs> is it looked at not only the redirected traffic from the Santa Fe Mineral intersection on the quad road, but also the internal traffic that'll be using it for this development and the traffic from the development to the south once it does redevelop the Toll Brothers facility for the the remaining 70 acres of the south, and it actually even incorporated future development of the um, Littleton Equine Center, the potential for that to develop in the future, and some of that traffic even coming up and using the quad road to get to Mineral and to Santa Fe. So there, yeah, there's the, the video that kind of shows. Thank you. Thank you. I think I work. understand it now. Thank you, Aaron. That was really helpful. Um, so the second part of that question is, what is the speed that they are traveling through this development? What is the speed going sure. to be? Our expectations is we will sign this at 30 miles per hour. So it won't be as slow as, you know, a residential street at 25 miles per hour, but it also won't be like a typical arterial. We're not expecting people to drive on the quad road like they would on Mineral or Santa Fe. We don't do want to keep um, volumes down and the way it's going to handle the traffic that uses it is not based on speed but based on timing between all of the signals that will be in the area so we'll still have a signal operating at mineral in santa fe it'll just be what we call a two-phase signal so it'll only give a green light for santa fe to go and then it'll give a green light for mineral to go just two phases a lot simpler than having to have time for all those different left turns then we'll have a new signal on Santa Fe where the quad road comes out at Nichols. And that'll be a T intersection. So it'll be, it'll allow a northbound left to turn onto the quad road. It'll allow an eastbound left to turn off the quad road onto Santa Fe to go northbound. And then it'll of course also accommodate Santa Fe north and southbound traffic through there. And then we'll have the signal that exists at Mineral and Platte River Parkway, so the other end of the quad road. And we'll make that into a four-legged intersection. Um, anyone that's driven through it today, it's just three legs because Platte River keys into mineral today. And again, that signal, the signal of mineral in Santa Fe, and the new signal on Santa Fe at Nichols will all be coordinated so that when you make a left, for example, off of Santa Fe onto Nichols and come around the quad road and you come up to the mineral on Platte River Parkway, you'll get a green there to go through the intersection. So all of it will be coordinated to, to move traffic smoothly through the area without having to require high speed to do that. Great. All right. Thank you, Council. Or uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Unless there's more questions or discussions, I'm. Yeah, go ahead. Pretty All ready right. to make. Council Member Milliman. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I do have a couple questions. The. Um, Maybe Reed can um, talk a little bit about this, but the impact fees. There are no impact fees for this development based on um, the 1985 um, plan. Is that right? Yeah, based upon the annexation agreement that the city entered into with the Enser uh, property owners back in 19, I want to say it came in in 1985. Um, one of the conditions of with that was that we could not assess any impact fees. So no impact fees are being given to the city as a result of any development on that property. Okay, thank you. Um, with the um, assisted living, uh, the $120 per unit, is that based on if the unit is occupied or not? It's occupied units occupied. would be assessed $120 a month. So any um, unoccupied units, we would not assess any fees. That's $120. correct. $120. Okay. Um, I know that um, uh, with the assisted living development, um, I think, Tyler, you had said that um, a lot of the um, people who live there would um, 
be um, shopping at the retail or going to the restaurants and the bars. Help me understand how those um, those residents can safely get from where they are to those um, those retail sites or those restaurants or bars. Great question, and the we haven't fully finalize the street section design and the pedestrian crossings. You know, there will be pedestrian crossings at, at the traffic circle, uh, which will need to, and I don't know with Keith if we're anticipating some sort of, you know, hawk pedestrian signals there or not. Um, that's, we haven't just gotten to that level of design yet. There will be pedestrian crossings for sure at Santa Fe and Nickel. There'll be a f signalized intersection and they'll, pedestrians will be able to cross it at that juncture. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's also the, it doesn't help the senior housing component, but there is the, the pedestrian trail on the far western edge that will bring people from the Toll Brothers property to the south up as well. That'll probably be the safest way to get north-south um, because there's no proximity to automobiles. But it'll be through the Nichols-Santa Fe intersection and then some sort of ped crossing at that traffic circle. Uh, and But we have to work with Aaron and Keith and the, our traffic engineers just to make sure that that can be done safely. Yeah, I'm just looking at the illustrative, and thank you for the answer. Sure. I'm looking at the illustrated plan, and I know that that's just what it is, but I, I do have um, some concerns about those elderly residents if they did want to get out. Um, it's not, I don't think that this site is going to be big as big as a Windcrest, which has no, um, yeah. restaurants Much and smaller. bars and banks and everything, you know, on site. Um, but in looking at the illustrated plan, I don't see a lot of safe, walkable, accessible routes for those seniors if they truly are in that, that life care plan. They're in independent living versus assisted living or memory care. Correct. I'm, I'm quite certain, uh, and they're not here tonight to speak, but the senior housing group that we're working with will have a shuttle. Uh, that's a pretty common amenity for those type of continuum care units because they go full spectrum from independent to assisted down to memory care. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, for those who are in the independent living space, a lot of them at that point have given up their cars, whether by choice or not. And so there is a, a, a circulator van that will take them places. And my guess is that the majority will probably elect to use that van, which will, I'm sure, hop across the street frequently because that'll be the closest shopping amenities and that there will be fewer that walk um, just because of just mobility challenges if you're at that stage of your life. Um, but they, they will have a circulator van of their own that will take them anywhere, not necessarily just a river park. It could go to Old Town Littleton or the local grocery store. And one last question, I'm actually tacking on uh, to Pam's question about the parking. Mm -hmm. I think at our meeting two weeks ago, um, you had uh, shared with us that, um, I think you're pretty adamant about it that the, I think it was the 15 to 1,000, 15 spaces per 1,000 square feet that retailers could not work, they could not go any lower than that. Pen to paper, they could not do it. You were not going to ask them to do it. You were fighting for the retailers, very emotional mm -hmm. about it. And I appreciate that. Tonight, um, now we're down to seven spaces per 1,000 square feet. Tell me how you came to to that conclusion that yeah. that was the, the prior to you. The prior condition of approval was for two per thousand for surface parking, and two per thousand just doesn't work. That doesn't even work in, in downtown Denver. Now, to be fair, it was two per thousand of, you could do more if it was structured, but I uh, also knew that if we did end up having a retail do, uh, dominated harvest district, that retail users cannot afford structured parking without some sort of public private partnership. So that's why I knew that we couldn't park at two per thousand, which was forcing a structure that the retailers also couldn't afford. And that's why, you know, we worked hard with staff to try to figure out, okay, what, what is that optimal max level of surface parking if there's never a garage, you know, and, and that with all those different permutations, the blend of retail at five versus the restaurants at 12 is how we kind of got to this average of seven, which the planning commission also came up with as well. Um, if we have a strong parking structure, then that just simply allows us to add more density of uses, which is great because same fixed amount of land, we can just add more, more buildings, whether it's vertical or just horizontally. 
Uh, so I, I'm comfortable with it because I was always solving on average for the seven per thousand. The problem was the max two per thousand and we were never able to get garage funding and then we're stuck with a sterilized property or insufficient parking just because we couldn't afford structured. Okay. Does, that, does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. All right. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah. Could we actually maybe do a break? Is that, you know, is that okay with you? Are you ready for a break? Yeah. I sure. Think I am. It is uh, 4 or 8.41. Let's come back at 8.45. Four minutes.
are back from our break. It is 846. I'm going to go back to Mayor Pro Tem. Thanks, Mayor. Um, since I think council and staff and the developer are done with our the questions and conversation, um, looking forward to just making my record. And so here goes. Um, I really do want to start again by uh, saying a sincere thank you to staff. It's uh, very evident to me the amount of effort that has gone into uh, the proposal that council has in front of it. Yeah. And I also want to say a sincere thank you to the developer uh, and reiterate that I hope uh, post ULUC in Littleton, no developer has to hang in there for three years to get to this point. That's far too long, far too long. Um, this is an incredibly hard vote for me. I feel that. Um, certainly harder than any uh, vote I can remember making in my, my tenure on council. And I've reflected on why it's hard, and I, I, I think there's two reasons. Well, one, uh, with, with sort of two, uh, two subparts to it. Um, I feel constrained, um, and I am constrained. Um, I feel constrained by the existing PD, which I think everyone exists is probably not the highest and best use for this property. Um, and, and to the members of the public who, who called in or, or wrote us emails and said, well, hey, just turn it down and make the developers do this and do that, it's not the way it works, right? They have property rights under the existing plan development. And if council turns down their request tonight, they can go break ground under the existing PD tomorrow. Um, and that worries me. But I have confirmed with the city attorney that I am not allowed under the rules of our quasi-judicial process that govern this request and our decision on it to consider that. I simply cannot consider what happens if council says no. Okay. Um, I feel constrained, too, by the rules of our quasi-judicial decision-making. Um, would that I could uh, make happen on this property what I want and what, what I believe the community wants. But again, that's not the way it works here. We have criteria that we have to make our decision based upon, and those criteria do not include, Scott, what do you want? <laughs> and Scott, what do you think the community wants? Um, and that makes this a hard vote, uh, I truly hope, uh, because I recognize the importance of this property to the community, that the vote I cast is at least conscientious, well-informed, hopefully it's the right vote. I don't know, it's hard to tell, it truly is. Um, so I'm going to go through the criteria um, and give my comments on those, and I'll try to be quick about it. Number one is encourage more creative and effective use of land and public or private services and to accommodate changes in land development technology so that the resulting economies benefit the community. You know, there are a couple items in the staff report that really stood out to me. Uh, the first is, um, this is more or less a quote that, this proposal is very similar to typical suburban commercial developments which are not near major transit infrastructure. And this represents a lost opportunity. And another is uh, in the economic uh, analysis portion of the staff report, and again, this is more or less a quote. The junior anchors, other than a specialty grocer, uh, their sales would come at the expense of existing retailers in Littleton. You know, we have an issue um, at Littleton Village uh, and, and the commercial development there. I know that's for a complicated set of reasons. Some of them are shared with this proposal, some not. We have vacant storefront uh, at Aspen Grove, and what I do not want to see is just another strip mall development. Uh, when it comes to the commercial, I don't say that with any judgment. Um, I, I don't mean to demean the phrase strip mall. I just, uh, I, I think that um, there is a uh, higher purpose for this, for this property uh, than to do what we've tried and, and, and is not necessarily thriving elsewhere in the city. And, you know, certainly I would want um, any 
uh, commercial development, any retail development in the city to complement what already exists in the city uh, and not to take away from some of our other businesses. I want a net gain. I want a clear gain for the city. I don't want our businesses competing unnecessarily with one another. So I don't think that criteria is satisfied. The second is encourage innovation and efficiency in residential development to meet the growing demands for housing of all types and designs for persons of any social or economic status. Um, the assisted living um, isn't unambiguously housing. It's sort of a hybrid of housing and medical care. Uh, but more importantly for me, it's um, private pay only. It doesn't accept Medicare. Um, and as far as I can tell from the uh, illustrations that we have in the proposal, the, um, and, and based on comments of the developer, the apartments will be market. And I would say again, based on the illustrations bordering on luxury, uh, you know, swimming pools and, and so on. Um, so I don't think that that um, criteria is satisfied. Uh, number three is encourage innovative development or redevelopment of all land uses to meet the contemporary needs of the community by providing for a greater variety and mix of uses, including those which may coexist on the same parcel or within the same building as shown on an approved general PD plan. You know, we've, we've emphasized mix, mi true mixed use development as the closest thing we have to a silver bullet in this city when it comes to meeting our civic needs. Mixed use done correctly enhances community character because of its aesthetics, it creates sales tax revenue, it creates housing. Um, that's what I would want to see here, mixed use. And I don't mean uh, different uses located in close proximity to one another. I mean true mixed use, all in the same building. And that's not what I've seen in the proposal. I see the old uh, Euclidean zoning just happening on a smaller scale. And so for me, uh, that, that uh, criteria is not, is not satisfied either. Um, four is provide a process which relates to the design, which relates the design and development of a site to the particular characteristics of the site. This is the, this is the most important one for me and the one that I think is farthest from being satisfied. Um, I wish that this parking structure and pedestrian bridge could happen certainly and happen overnight, but I think this is only a hypothetical. Um, it's very possible that we never get this parking structure. And if we do, it's a decade out. And the reason I, I highlight that is because for me, the main characteristic of this site is its proximity to the light rail. This site is begging for transit oriented development. And I don't think that we are going to have that. And if we do, I think it's go going to be on a timeline that is is far too long for this criteria to be satisfied for me. Um, I would add that um, another important characteristic of the site um, is its proximity to the river. Um, you know, there's a buffer here. Uh, there's a sort of a berm and a split rail fence. I can appreciate that to a certain extent, but um, you know, the East Trail in particular uh, of South Platte Park is a cherished part of the city for a lot of people. And I would want to see this development make a pretty exceptional effort to complement, support, protect that experience and the ecology of the park. I, I don't see that happening. Um, number five, require the nature and intensity of development be supported by adequate utilities, transportation, network, drainage systems, and open space to serve the development and to minimize impacts on adjacent existing and future uses. I think, yeah, this one probably is satisfied. I think that there's been a lot of creative thought that's gone into trying to work out some of these very, very difficult infrastructure problems on this parcel, and I think that the developer in consultation with staff has come about as close as anybody's gonna come. Um, the traffic situation down there is a nightmare, but the quad road, I think, would, um, if not lessen the traffic situation, at least keep us at neutral. It wouldn't make it worse. I think, uh, even though the concept is unproven, 
uh, it probably would work and it'd be um, a pretty interesting um, approach to the issue down there. Uh, there's floodplain issues that I think have been adequately addressed. Um, and so I think that this, this, uh, this probably has been uh, probably has been satisfied as much as anyone can on this incredibly difficult, difficult intersection. And again, I really do appreciate everyone's thoughtfulness and creativity in trying to make those things work. And and you know the the reach that uh, the developer put into um, and our traffic engineer Aaron put into making this quad road uh, sort of a viable idea. Um, and the last one. I encourage development that is consistent with the policies and guidelines established in the adopted comprehensive plan for the area and for the city. It's a bit of a catch-all. I'm not even going to uh, go into it. And so um, with truly humility uh, and the hope that I've done the right thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not support the request. So thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Pat Driscoll. Yes, I'd, uh, Mayor, I'd like to make... Uh, Move to approve ordinance 04-2021, uh, an ordinance on second reading approving the second amendment to the Santa Fe Park uh, Development Plan, River Park, and amending the official zoning map accordingly. Second. So it has been motioned and seconded by Valdez. Council discussion. Looks like we have no more discussion, so we... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I appreciate... What, going through the criteria, and I think it's real important. And, but if I could just synthesize and see if I'm correct, is the reason you're not supporting this is because of cannibalization of current retail, senior living is private pay, um, you want apartments on top of retail, and it's too close to the Platte River, is that kind of it? There's not enough buffer of Pratt River. I just want to kind of make sure I understand. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I don't really want to go through uh, it all again. I, yeah. I mean, those are some of the reasons I hope I expressed, but uh, I don't think those are all of the reasons uh, that I expressed. No, um, no. It, 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 what if you? We t some one of the um, citizens says take this back to zero. If you could take back to zero, what is it that this is not doing for you? In essence, not, I mean, you, I, I understand the, the specifics, but in your heart, what is it not doing that you want it to do? It, it, maybe it'd be better if you expressed your, I mean, I think uh, account, uh, Mayor Pro Tem just spent a few minutes going over his thoughts. Maybe you could express yours. And I guess real quick, I would just say that's an important question. For Reed's sake, I'm not going to answer it. Uh, I, I, th I think we're I think we're constrained by the criteria. I, what I want in my heart is yeah. irrelevant to the. Okay. Yeah. So, All right. Yeah. That, 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 you, you're right. We are. We have to go by the criteria, and it just. I look at the criteria a little bit differently. So, um, but thank you. That's. Helpful. Is that it? Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Anyone? Else? Uh, Council Member Elrod. Um. Thank you for your comments. Um. Scott and I will I will also state that this is a very difficult um, decision um, and continue to contemplate um, how how I will consider this but there are a couple of things that um, do stand out for me um, and this was, you know, a few comments that came actually from the applicant uh, two weeks ago, that this place is to be as special as Littleton is, that this place will be a place to linger, um, it, it, that they are creating and wanting to create a sense of place. Um, but I don't see that. I haven't seen that. I... Um, I feel like these are things that we're hoping for, but have not been materialized as presented and as um, articulated through the various uses. Another statement that was made by the applicant was how difficult and impossible it was to satisfy all the various plans that were out there 
for this particular property. And I think that's exactly um, a challenge that we're all facing and recognize and why you've had to negotiate and compromise and be creative. Um, and this, I don't want to say despite all the effort, but the effort um, that went into this is absolutely commendable. But the effort alone for me does not say that this is the right project in the right place at the right time. We have several elements of this that are still very critical um, to, you know, what could potentially make this um, mm, palatable and good for Littleton. Um, a pedestrian bridge to me is a must. It is not a possibility or a hope. We can't rely on that. Um, to me, that would have been an absolute requirement from day one. The parking garage, I think, is, you know, uh, I don't know that a parking garage to satisfy um, RTD on this law is the right answer just because we potentially can. I'm not sure that we should. Um, it, you know, that would mean walking from a train station across one pedestrian bridge through a parking lot across another pedestrian bridge through potentially another parking lot to get to a parking garage. So I don't know that that, I don't know that we know right now that that is a, a good answer and a good asset and amenity to the community. So I, um, I, I do not feel that we are creating a place that is authentic for Littleton. Um, that is something that is um, an element of our comprehensive plan. Um, you know, is this, um, we as Littleton and many parts of our community feel that we are kind of anchored um, to what Littleton is. And right now, this to me, what is anchoring this is a um, assisted living. So there's nothing here that truly anchors this property um, in any significant way. So I, I will not be supporting this. Um, I do not believe it is the right project for um, Littleton at this time. City Attorney. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, as Council goes through kind of their summation um, uh, prior to their vote, I think it's important that uh, Council put on the record those parts of the criteria that you don't feel as if um, this is meeting or if it is meeting. Um, Council Member, our Mayor Pro Tem, uh, kind of went through a list. I don't necessarily expect all council members to go through the list, but simply saying uh, if it's meeting all the criteria for you is is good for the record, or if it's not meeting a particular one, then um, indicating what it is that that is. Um, some of the things that I think I heard, uh, at least prior to our break on the 420 hearing, and, and maybe some tonight, are, are some of the items that would be addressed more appropriately in an SDP than on a PDP amendment or a GDPDP amendment. Too many, too many acronyms. I mean, essentially what, what's before council tonight is um, agreeing to uses, uh, moving those uses into various parcels, as well as some of the, the design standards. I know when we show the illustratives and you know, it's easy to kind of look at, look at a map and, and picture that as being a future X or a future Y or a future Z, but that will come forward uh, during the SDP process. But just kind of my reminder to, um, I didn't know if we were gonna jump into a vote, but I wanted to make certain that council at least had on the record, um, you know, those items. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Council Member Grove, are you up? You're, I see your light on there. <laughs> okay. Council Member Milliman. I wasn't going to say anything, but I will. Um, and I echo what everybody else has said. I really appreciate all the time and the effort um, away from your families and the long weekends and all the collaboration. Um, and I echo, I'll just be brief. I, I, I think I spoke a lot. It's 
two weeks ago. Um, I, I agree with Councilmember Alrod. I, I feel like um, this is, it's a special place within our community. It's a very visible place within our community. Um, and I, I, I agree with her. I think the anchor right now is this assisted living and I still cannot understand why that is being proposed when we have so many other those businesses within our community. I, I, I just don't understand it. When I think there's so much of a more of an opportunity, I'll go back and quote what a um, caller said two weeks ago, do something spectacular. I, I don't feel like this is spectacular. I think it's um, not very creative. I feel like it is a very auto-oriented development, some walkability, um, but um, I'm just, I'm, I want to see more. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we haven't heard from Council Member Fay. I appreciate a lot what the developer has proposed, but when I look at the criteria, I have to really struggle to meet the criteria. So what I'm going to do is invite the developer and staff to keep going the direction you're going and, and come up with something even better. Um, number one of our criteria, encourage more creative and effective use of the land uh, to um, accommodate changes, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the big change I see there is transit-oriented development is, I mean, that, that's the end of the line for the, the light rail. And, and we're pretending with this development that, that light rail and development doesn't even exist. But I can't get to encourage innovation and efficiency. Um, and the important part here, growing demands or housing of all types and designs for persons of any social or economic status. So I have to piggyback on what's uh, one, one second, Carol. Ty, can you turn her volume up? I can probably get closer to. Thank you. Go ahead. Of um, this, the. The assisted living um, is is uh, looks very high end. Um, uh, the rest of it, um, yeah, um, I, I just don't see any way to stretch my imagination for uh, to address persons of any social or economic status. It's not that. Encourage innovative development or redevelopment to, to meet a you know, um, variety of mixed uses. Um, not really. Uh, the developer is asking for to flip around the uses that are prescribed, but it's the same usual uses um, and so on. So uh, the city attorney said we didn't have to address everything. And so I will just stop with that if that's... Um, that's enough justification. I want so much to say yes to the changes that are proposed. Um, yet, especially with the transit-oriented development, it's it's not enough to to honor the opportunity we have. So I will regretfully say no. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, final. If not, let's uh, go to our vote here. I think we've heard from everybody adequately. Okay, so uh, City Clerk, could you read back the motion, please? Certainly. Uh, Council Member Driscoll moved and Mayor Valdi seconded to approve Ordinance 04-2021 on second reading, approving the second amendment to the Santa Fe Park Plan Development River Park with conditions and I'm sorry, I lost the last word, modifying the zoning now. Okay, all right, cool. That is it. Uh, thumbs up is to approve, a thumbs down is to deny. Okay, ready, vote. The vote is two in favor with council members Milliman, Grove, Malin, Elrod, and Faye voting no, the motion fails. 
With that, uh, City Attorney, we have two other items on our agenda that are related to uh, that that last item. Yeah, if we could take a brief recess. Well, let's do um, it. Mayor, it is 9-11. Uh, let's come back at 9-15. We are reconvened. It is 915. Uh, City Attorney, I had a question on the table of do we need to go over the next two ordin proposed ordinances? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I've had an opportunity to speak with the applicant. So we currently have remaining 
on our agenda, ordinance number 05 2021 which was establishing uh, vested rights for Evergreen Mineral Santa Fe LLC, um, as well as an agreement, an IGA, between the city and River Park Metro District establishing a revenue sharing agreement that was contingent upon being allowed to have assisted living. So at this point, after speaking with the applicant, we're going to withdraw those two items as they are moot at this point. Um, being as how the PD amendment didn't pass, there's no point in having the vested rights agreement to vest something that didn't pass. Uh, and as the PD amendment did not pass, there's no sense in talking about a revenue sharing agreement because the revenue sharing agreement was uh, tied to having assisted living, which did not pass. So we'll just remove those two items from the agenda. Okay, and with that, Council, our next meeting will be May 11, 630. It's Tuesday. It's a study session. And it is Patrick or Driscoll. City Attorney, can we speak about this project now, or are we still in quasi-judicial? Uh, you can speak to whomever you want about the project right now. Yeah, okay. With that, it is 917, and we are adjourned. <laughs>